continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. And I don't often quote at length publishers blurbs for books Open Mind guests have just written. But I think that Alfred A. Knopf's is absolutely right on about the art of controversy, political cartoons and their enduring power by Victor S. Nabaski, longtime editor, then publisher of The Nation magazine, and now chairman of the Columbia Journalism Review identifying his new volume as, quote, a lavishly illustrated, witty, and original look at the awesome power of the political cartoon throughout history to engage, provoke, and amuse, a book that illumines just how transformative and incendiary cartoons can be. In it, my guest recounts how cartoonists and caricaturists have been censored, threatened, incarcerated, and even murdered for their art, and asks what makes this art form, too often dismissed as trivial, so uniquely poised to affect our minds and our hearts. Indeed, I would begin today by repeating E.L. Doctorow's conundrum as he comments on the art of controversy. Quote, just how does Victor Navasky, a word man, in investigating the wordless art of the political cartoon account for its implosive power? And I would put that question to you. <laughs> How do you account for it? You know, uh, in writing about this, towards the end of my, uh, when I got towards the end of the manuscript, I became very self-conscious about answering questions like the one you just posed with words. Since, <laughs> since what I discovered in the course of my journey was the language of imagery and visual language. And visual la and, and as you know, because we've known each other a long time, I am a card-carrying member of the American Civil Liberties Union. I'm a believer in Habermas and the power of the better argument. I think the way to deal with bad ideas is with better ideas. Along comes pictures that seem to be more powerful than words and what happens to that whole worldview that one has. So, uh, you know, what I tried to do in the art of controversy was first look at the obvious explanation of why people get so upset by cartoons, their content, and then second, the obvious thing about the fact that they are pictures their imagery and the power of imagery down through the years, starting with, maybe not starting with, may go back to Egyptian hieroglyphics, but the Old Testament, no graven images. And then there's this whole new field of neuroscience and a subcategory called neuroaesthetics, which attempts, which looks at, in effect, art as the stimulus and the brain as the place where the response takes place. And you put all those three things together and begin to get an understanding of it. But I have to say that I came to it in an odd way because, um, you know, I used to put out a political satire magazine many years ago. And, but as you said, for a long time in my life, 30 years or more, I worked at The Nation, first as editor, then as publisher. And only once in all of that time did the staff march on my office with a petition demanding that we not publish something. 
and it was a cartoon, a caricature by the great late David Levine, and with little notes on the side attacking it. And uh, and at the time, I thought what what it was was, uh, if I can use David's language, you can use it. Good. He called me one day and he said he had something he wanted me to look at and possibly for possible publication in the nation because it, he had done a caricature for New York Review, which was his usual venue, and it was, in his words, it was too strong for them. He said, let me tell you what it is. It is Ki Kiss Henry Kissinger with Kissinger on top and the world in the form of a woman's body on bottom, and Kissinger is screwing the world under an Amer American flag blanket. And he said, uh, w are you interested? I said, David, of course I'm interested, but it's going to get me in a lot of trouble. And he said, why is it going to get you in a lot of trouble? I said, I don't know, but I know it's going to get me in a lot of trouble. So the cartoon came over and it showed this, it's this exquisite caricature of Kissinger who had this look on his face which mingled ecstasy, ecstasy. and evil. And, um, uh, and there was no way you couldn't, but in his horn rim glasses. And it was funny at the same time as it was deeply disturbing. And the woman had a globe where her head would be and uh, under the American flag blanket he had described. And about two and a half later, a petition landed on my desk with little scrawls. One said, sexist, why isn't he doing it to a third world male? And uh, it was signed by 25 people. I had thought we only employed 23 people. <laughs> Actually, a couple of people didn't sign it, but we had interns who did sign it. And um, uh, at the time, I, and I called a meeting, and we had, we had two meetings, and David attended one of them and uh, said all the wrong things because, for example, the very articulate young woman in the office who was our assistant circulation manager said, the problem with this cartoon is that the nation is supposed to be fighting against stereotypes. And this cartoon reinforces the stereotype that sex is something that an active male on top does to a passive woman on bottom. And, and she's not wrong about that, although to me about that's the irrelevant. Stereotype. She's not wrong about the stereotype, and she, and she may, may or may not be wrong that it reinforces the stereotype, but to me, you publish it anyway because of what it's, what it's saying. And it's, what it's saying is that Kissinger, depending on how you read it, either, as Levine put it, is screwing the world, or Christopher Hitchens, who was on our staff at the time, uh, said, to me, he's raping the world, he's ravaging the world. And uh, however you read it, it was a cartoon that you could not not publish. So uh, it's a very complicated thing. But you say you could not not publish. Yeah. But now you say, as you think through all of the power yes. of the co political cartoon, yes. you have second questions. Oh, yeah. Because first of all, what I didn't understand at the time, I thought this was just another case of the left being wanting to be PC and right. not, not wanting to do anything that was anti-PC. And it was another case of the left wanting to be PC. But that's not what upset people so much in my view because, for example, we would have, I mentioned Christopher Hitchens, who would write columns against choice at a time when most of the nation readers and staff were deeply committed feminists, both men and women, believed in choice, and if they didn't like what, what Hitchens wrote, they would write a letter to the editor attacking Hitchens' column. And you or would a publish counter, it. Or, and we'd publish it, or a counter column, in Katha Pollitt's case, attacking Christopher's view of the world on those matters. It didn't occur to me at the time that it was, you cannot answer, it, it was the fact that it was politically incor incorrect and visually, in the language, in visual language, and that uh, it was the fact that it was an image that was politically incorrect rather than just the political correctness that upset people. And I later decided, and I didn't understand that, it was so obvious, but I didn't understand it until the Danish cartoonists did their cartoons of Muhammad and people all over the world, Muslims all over the world, marched, hundreds of thousands took to the streets, embassies were shut down, goods, uh, companies were boycotted, Prices were put on the cartoonists' heads. And so then I got interested in what's going on here, your question. And, and it turned out they had thrown Daumier into prison for his caricature of Louis Philippe. And you go all the way back and... Um, 
And so that's when I started looking into it, and, uh, and here we have the result of that. What's happening now with the lot? Of well, the political you know, there's a cliche that cartoonists are an endangered species because of what's happening in the newspaper business. And one one thinks of the classic cartoonists, one thinks of uh, Herb Block and people who illustrated whose cartoons appeared accompanying editorials on the editorial pages. And it is true there are fewer of them than there were before on the one hand. On the other hand, the Internet has opened up a whole new... Uh, opportunity for visual imagery and every day there's a new app invented and there are new visuals that go along with it some of them animation some of them sequences some of them caricatures and so I think that they're here to, they're not only here to stay they're proliferating in the culture and um, the same thing that I started to say applied with uh, cartoons that when I started to say that if you didn't like a, a column you could write a letter to the editor there is no such thing as a cartoon to the editor or a caricature to, to the editor unless you happen to be a cartoonist or right. a caricature so there's a feeling of impotence that comes that I think adds to the rage that some people feel if they personally are attacked or someone that they closely identify with because there's very little they can do about it. And then to add fuel to that fire, caricatures are by definition unfair. They are, the nose is longer and uh, they, they, they exaggerate. And so how do you take this unfairness? And then on top of that, there is the nagging suspicion in many cases that despite the fact that it is grotesque and unfair and you don't know how to respond to it, they got to the real you. That they <laughs> underneath why, it. But why got would that be that why would that be true of the visual rather than the written? Uh, well that's the great question that I grapple with here. And uh, in the Do you old, accept in, this brain uh, notion? Well well the, there is a whole neuroscience field as I mentioned which we can get to. But even before we do that, historically, the most famous line about, in answer to your question, was uttered by Boss Tweed, who was brought down by the cartoonist Thomas Nast with his famous cartoons of Tweed. And Tweed said, uh, I, don't give a, I don't care about what they write about me. My constituents can't read. But it's those goddamn pictures. Get rid of those goddamn pictures. Because he saw that the masses of people would see them. And, uh, and, and in an ironic afternote, he was actually in flight from this country and was spotted in Spain by recognized. someone who recognized him from Nass Pictures, and they hauled him back to this country. And he went to prison along with the Tammany ring that he, he was, that he was, that was part of the corruption, so. Victor, you started off by saying, or have always been a card-carrying member of the yeah. ACLU. Right. And then you brought up the question about the cartoon that your right. staff right. rejected, but that you said were printing it. Yes. Now that you've studied the matter more, you said you appreciated yes. more what their concern was. Uh, would you have today not published? Well, interesting question, because there are two, and two parts to the answer is number one, 90% of the people who signed that petition are embarrassed today that they signed it. By because, their position. Because what happened after, after the, this appeared, about five years later was the nation's 125th anniversary. Columbia University, where I did not yet teach, decided that they were going to commemorate the anniversary by having an art show of the nation's artists over the years. The nation's artists have included Ben Sean, William Gropper, uh, a whole series of the most, some of the most distinguished artists in the, in the country, if not the world, and uh, The Nation is America's oldest weekly magazine. It was founded in 1865. And uh, so their curator went through thousands of pictures. He picked out 40 for the exhibit. David Levine's was one of the 40. <laughs> when the exhibit traveled up to Harvard, they put David Levine's Kissinger on the cover. So, so there was a sort of vindication in the decision in that 
uh, very limited sense. So, th so number one, no, of course I would publish it again in a minute, but no problem. But as so would a lot of the other people who were there. On the other hand, when uh, the Danish, when the New York Times wrote a an editorial saying that uh, condemning the censorship of the Danish Muhammad cartoons, but nevertheless explaining why the Times wasn't republishing them, they said a few things. They said number one. It has never been Times policy to needlessly offend any segment of our readers, especially when issues of race or stereotype are involved. And number two, you, besides, you can describe them. Uh, and so it doesn't matter if you, if you don't see them. And as I read the besides, I thought, well, this is absolutely wrong because you can't describe a cartoon. You've got to experience it. You can describe it, but you miss what is essential about it? When I talked to the great British caricaturist, Ralph Steadman, he said to me, you know, what we do, what I do, is I, I put in images what you can't put into words. He said, you've told me this story about David Levine. That doesn't begin to describe what Levine did with that picture. And, uh, and that's what we do. It's what you can't put into words. So. So I just assumed the Times was wrong not to run those. I still believe partly that they were wrong. When the time came to decide, do we publish them in this book, uh, there were three or four other factors that came up. Number one, I had a publisher that was concerned that um, who knew, even though it's many years, it's some years later, that um, selling this book might not result in a bookstore being bombed, whether in New York City or Paris or, or whatever it was. Number two, it might result in Amazon deciding not to carry the book on Amazon. Number three, you can see these cartoons anywhere on Google. I can tell you how to do it right now. You put Google Danish cartoons of Muhammad and, and many of them will come up. Number four, the cartoons were not very good. And number five, I discovered one cartoon about the whole controversy by the French cartoonist Plantu, who does cartoons for the Le Monde, that was so much better than all the others and said it all. And what it shows is an artist's hand and his crayon, and he's writing, I must not uh, paint, I must not depict Muhammad, I must not depict Muhammad. I must not depict Muhammad. And by the time he's written it a hundred times, there is a perfect depiction of someone who looks very much like Muhammad. And that was captured all of the paradoxes of this thing. So what I said in, in The Art of Controversy was I, I described these, exactly what I'm telling you now, and then I gave the reader an assignment. The reason you will not find the original cartoons here is A, the publisher doesn't want to publish them, B, uh, they're concerned about Amazon. C, the cartoons are not that good anyway. D, you can find them on the internet. E, Plantu's cartoon is better and a few more reasons. F, all of the above. Correct answer, F. It was all of the above. So there we are. Is this? So, but I said to myself, who am I to, even though I felt that about the New York Times at the time, who am I to put other, other people's lives or real estate at risk for some theoretical principle that I believe that I believe in on the one hand, although it is true that with the, in the age of the internet that you can see them, unlike the Times' explanation, you don't have to see them, you can see them, and they're not all that good, and so they're not all that powerful in themselves. And there is a woman named Clausen, who's a professor up in Boston, who wrote a very good book about the Danish cartoons. The Yale University Press published it. They wouldn't publish the cartoons with it to her dismay. But in the book, she documents without question that most of the people who protested never saw the cartoons themselves. And that one of the reasons they were so outraged was that two imams were dispatched across the Muslim world and they showed a set of cartoons, some of which were the original cartoons, one of which the most powerful of them showed a Muhammad with, where his turban was with a bomb on top, right. and, which was taken to be a statement that all Muslims are terrorists, and that was one of the reasons that people resented them so much. 
but, a, a, but others were not in the original batch of cartoons. One showing Muhammad's genitals and other things so that there was this disjunction between the actual fact and the response. Which brings me to the question of whether you've uh, softened, calmed down, uh, became, become uh, less of a civil libertarian, or what? Yeah. Or is this in the whole category of cop-out? <coughs> well, that's what do you for, think? That's for other people to judge, but I don't think so. I mean, my political belief is that cartoons and visual language is a form of expression and and it shouldn't be censored either so even though pictures may be poor, more pow powerful than words uh, they should fall under First Amendment protection and the only time the Supreme Court has dealt with the issue that I could find was in a case involving of all people Hustler magazine and in that case the court said that that these pictures and they were uh, uh, caricatures of Reverend Falwell in there, and he had sued, and they said, they are protected, they are a form of, of editorial statement. And uh, I agree with that, although I, I believe that it happens in a very different way, and we don't fully understand yet how it happens. You asked about neuroscience, and there are these experiments in neuroscience, which I report on in the book, um, which to me suggest something important but they don't prove anything. Uh, and I can give you an example of one of them. Uh, there, there, there is a neuroesthetician named uh, Ramachandran, and he, uh, and there was an experiment done that involved herring gull chicks. And these herring gull chicks, they get their sustenance, the young, the young chicks, from, they peck on their mother's beak, and she feeds them. The mother's beak is long and yellow and has a red dot on the end. The social psycho psychologist, the neuroscientist, introduced into a world of herring gold chicks long yellow sticks. And the longer the stick and the more red dots they put on the end, the more avidly the herring gold chicks pecked on them. Uh, does that indicate that uh, that these that there's an emotional response that goes with the what what Ramachandran said is the equivalent of a caricature, the exaggeration of what you what you see, and there are a whole set of experiments which show that people tend to recognize caricatures m more easily than they recognize photographs of real people and and yet they get more emotionally involved in the caricature than in the thing. And, and there are also experiments with rats with rectangles and squares which show the same thing. Ramachandran leaps from that to making statements about caricature uh, because caricature involves the same kind of exaggeration that these experiments uh, attempt to reproduce. I'm not persuaded. That, that these experiments are anything more than suggestive. They are very interesting. The brain is a mysterious thing. There are hundreds of millions of things that go on in the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain. And I'm, I know enough to know that I don't know enough. Fair enough. Uh, leading me, though, to ask you, and I say leading me because somebody's going to say, how did you get from here to there? What has happened to your uh, absolutist uh, free speech, First Amendment proclivities. Anything at all over the uh, years? Well, I... Um, in just a couple of minutes that we have yeah, left. Yeah, a couple of minutes. Um, you know, in, the, in this book, I reprint the pictures in Der Sturmer. And Der Sturmer ran weekly caricatures on their cover that were vile, anti-Semitic, caricatures of Jews, and they set the image of the Jew in Germany in the years running up to World War, to World War II. And uh, the, Jules Stryker, who was the editor and owner of Der Sturmer, was the only defendant at Nuremberg who was executed, who was not a member of the, Hitler's, uh, in fact, the military equivalent of his staff. 
And, uh, and I think the court understood the power of these things. I was talking about this before some audience of journalists and uh, in Rutgers a few weeks ago. And, uh, and I said, if I had been the editor of Der Sturmer, uh, I would not have run these caricatures. <laughs> but that's not a free speech issue. That's an aesthetic judgment and political judgment. I would have had nothing to do with it. But I said, there is a question about whether, as a matter of law, one should have been allowed to run these caricatures. I still have the presumption that it is wrong to keep people from doing what they should be, al what they should be allowed to do as a matter of free speech theory. But I'm troubled by it. And at, th at this point, someone in the audience started applauding. And, uh, it wasn't Floyd and, Abrams. And the matter was not Floyd. And, uh, and I have differences with Floyd about corporate speech. And I have to say, we were in school together. I have so much admiration for him, and I like him. But uh, the moderator at that point wanted to know, called on this guy who was, why are you applauding? And he said, well, I agree with him that there are questions about whether you should do it. But the chairman of the panel was Bob Shear, who started attacking me for uh, selling out because I raised questions about whether you ought to publish these vicious Der Sturmer cartoons. Well, the question of selling out is an important one, and it's the one I wanted to yeah. raise. And of course, what's happening is I'm getting the signal, signal we have no more time. Okay. So we can't pursue it. But another time we will. Okay. Thanks for joining me so Thank much you. today, Thank Victor Navasky. Right. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to reprise this program online right now or to draw upon our archive of 1,500 or so other open mind and related programs. That's 13.org slash open mind. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.